those questions, that hunger is there in everybody. And for many of us, particularly in Ireland, we get such a, for want of a better term, a watered down nonsense version of the faith. There's no other way to describe it. Could we move to that kind of topic? I just, you know, just the state of Ireland in general, I mean, so many people have commented on this that yeah. it was once the land of saints and scholars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what is it that we've or you have traded your halos and manuscripts in for? Yeah. So, so what is the state of Catholicism in um, Ireland today? Uh, is it okay if I give a bit of context and sure. just go back a bit further? Please, yeah. Um, so, it was it was the land of saints and scholars. It was a phenomenally fruitful um, land of Catholic faith of real piety. Um, and a real contribution to the church. I mean, we'll skip right up until, um, you know, the 14th, 15th century. Um, that's what the Irish church was, okay? Then you have the political wars in Europe and the Reformation, and then Ireland was a guinea pig in that many ways because it was a back door to England, and the French landed there, the Spanish landed there. So the British and the Protestant regime really tried to quash it, and we had a couple of hundred years of real persecution real suppression of the faith, like, a, you know, a significant... Book. Yeah, tell us what that looked like for those who aren't aware. Yeah, so um, when when the Reformation happened and England became Protestant, uh, Ireland was under English-British rule, so then that uh, suppression, that closing of monasteries, that taking of church lands, that hanging of the priest from the nearest tree, that... Um, jailing of people if they didn't swear an oath of loyalty to the you know to the king as the head of the church, the denouncing of popish loyalties, the denouncing of popish priests, the the um the like for a long time the oath to be a member of parliament in, in included, you know, denouncing the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mass, and the church as idolatrous. Um so they took those types of things. How that was manifested on the ground, um no churches allowed to be built. Mass was illegal. Um, people would literally have to hide their priests. Um, so, like in different times, they, they go to mass rocks. Did you ever visit a mass rock whenever you were in Ireland? Yes. Yeah. So, for those who don't know, it was there was no churches. Mass was legal, so they went into the forests and they found a flat piece of stone, a nice place that was secluded, usually with maybe a position to look out to see whether any authorities coming. They would have had to walk in ones and twos in complete silence. Somebody would have carried a candlestick. Somebody would have carried the bravery or the lectionary. Somebody would have carried the vestments. Somebody would have carried something else. And only then, whenever people were arrived and looked around and everybody knows everybody, then the priest comes out and he says mass, sometimes even behind a screen so the faithful wouldn't actually see his face and be able to give him away. Um, but that was the the depth and the strength of the Irish faith and Irish priesthood where these priests and bishops were martyred, like hung, and while they were still alive, disemboweled, you know, um, and brought to England, put on trial for false charges. In many respects in Ireland, trial without jury was done away with, um, and they really tried to quash uh, the Catholic faith in Ireland, giving incentives that, you know, if you if you dropped uh, a certain Irishness in your name and you became a Protestant, we'll give you more food and money. You know, we're literally trying to coerce people into the faith. But through that... How pre- long did that sort of persecution last you're ta- for? You're talking 1640s right up until uh, mid 1700s, mid 1700s to maybe eight, early 1800s, mm. you know. Um, so roughly, you know, it, because there was wars, but previous to that, there were different rebellions at different times, you know. That was the depth and strength of the Irish priest who though that they were prepared to lie under bushes in the caves, in fields, to come and feed their flock and give them the sacraments and keep the strength and the burning fire of faith alive in Ireland. That's our heritage. That's a big part of what I think needs to happen in Ireland is a reclaim, reclaiming of our narrative. Because yes. our narrative is a tired, old, scandal-ridden, ineffectual and unconvincing church. That's what I what I understood that's what i was brought up with yes i was 26 and who wants to be a part of that absolutely absolutely i was 26 before i met a real on fire catholic and he just changed my life because we have the answers to the questions like i said previously i, I had this image of you know a sort of smoldering fire that it just yeah. needs to be fanned into flame mm-hmm. and things like you happen <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in ireland you know when, yeah. when a holy man comes along i mean uh who was it said that uh like one christian being fully Christian or one Catholic being fully Catholic can change the world. Yeah. You know? Um, and like Ireland 
Ireland has 28 bishops for a population one million less than the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Wow. Okay. Now they're ancient and there was, you know, there's different reasons for why that's the case. But the minute we, we have, I think maybe like, maybe, maybe 30 seminarians, we have roughly the same amount of seminarians, we have bishops, there might be even less uh, seminarians and bishops. But a reclamation of our narrative, and that I never got taught in school the history of the Irish Church, what St. Patrick did and who he was, what the Irish monasteries did and how they ultimately re-evangelized and saved Western civilization by re-evangelizing whole swathes of Europe after the fall of the Roman Empire, of the, the martyrs who persevered, who went through persecution, who knew the love of God and lived it to the point of shedding their blood. That's that's the heritage yeah. we have, you know. <clears throat> I agree that we, yeah, we have. You guys have to reclaim that narrative. Yeah. But of course, I think in order to do that, you have to look squarely at the abuses that have taken oh, place yeah. and yeah, how yeah. bad things are in Ireland right now. Yeah. I mean, do you agree with that? As <laughs> you'd love the espresso. Sorry. That's good. As, I mean, as opposed to obviously, you don't want to sweep anything under the rug. You don't. Yeah. Want to go, oh, let's no, no, stop no. looking at the reality of yeah, Ireland. Yeah, let's, yeah. let's look back to the glory yeah, days. Yeah. And hopefully, absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I just just share a story here. I remember my wife and I lived in Ireland for three years and um, while we were there we were going to run a retreat at a particular retreat center and I remember you know showing up and <clears throat> I think it was a Benedictine monastery or something but you've got these priests and their clerics you know call me John you know okay Father John and that sort of thing and I remember going into their chapel and being surprised uh, because there were yoga mats you know all over the floor and yeah. and the tabernacle wasn't present and I wasn't really sure what was going on and I remember going next door to the library and in the corner, I was looking at the books and in the corner on the floor was a tabernacle. Uh, and I thought that can't be the tabernacle that was surely, well, maybe this is an old tabernacle. And I, I bent down and I, I, I opened it up because it wasn't locked. And sure enough, the blessed sacrament was there. And I fell to my knees and sort of made an act of faith and Realize that, okay, someone has removed the blessed sacrament from the chapel in order to teach yoga. Like that was what, that was my kind of impression of yeah. where much of Catholic Ireland is. Now there's yeah. pockets of hope and tremendous yeah. Yeah. faithful people, yeah. 100%. But I think by and large, it, it feels like that. It's, it's almost like a, a new paganism. Yeah. I heard somebody say that it's as if, and I'm not making this statement, so you can correct it if you think it's incorrect. It's as if Ireland was like a child who grew up under an abusive parent and then just decided to rebel and just say, okay, we're yeah. old enough, we're done with this thing. So, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. speak yeah, to yeah. that. So, well, <laughs> I mean, we could trade stories back and forth about horrendous things that have happened, but <laughs> we don't want to scandalize anybody. Um, the abusive parent thing, um, I think, has, has truth to it. Uh, so, we had this incredible faith. We had this persecution. We had this strength. 1930s, 1920s, 1930s, Ireland gets independence. The southern 26 gets independence. Again, I'm from the north, so I still think we were left behind. Anyway, look into that. <laughs> um, they get independence, and the church had such goodwill and such a standing with the people, such a, you will bat for me. You've got my back. You will come and give me the sacraments, even risk your life. You will support the Catholic Emancipation Movement in the 1820s, where we get the chance to vote and put members of Catholics into Parliament. You will support the repeal of the Act of Union, where we want our own government and we want a Catholic nation. We want to be able to practice our faith. You'll support us in that. You'll come to us and you'll stay with us through thick and thin. The new government brings, and the Irish Church was given an incredible level of deference, an incredible level of authority and social standing. So... I mean, the nuncio of the Pope was given one of the former estates of the British administration. That's where he was. Oh, this is our this is our guy now, you know, that, that the crown and the English are gone type thing. Um, and when it comes to schools, they're all Catholic schools. Universities, Catholic universities. Hospitals, Catholic hospitals. Politics, people take their cue from the bishops. Okay? So that context explains the kind of abusive parent thing where we get where it's like our trust was so deep and the status of the priest in our society was so high that the fall then went so far. I moved to America in August 18, right after the, the grand jury reports, right after the Cardinal McCarrick. And I was like, God, what am I? From one place to the other, I was like, jeepers, what are we doing here? You know, I don't want to compare scandals, but because Ireland is small and virtually Everybody had a priest or a nun or religious in some part of their family. 
that felt that hurt was so much deeper. And because of the status of the priest, the fall was further. And then there was a real reaction. And the church almost took the place of the British in the oppressor, in the, you're the one that's holding us back from our freedoms. You're the one that's, yeah. because coupled with that, there was a tendency towards Jansenism in the Irish church and clergy. You know, the fire, hell, brimstone, nobody's worthy, you, you know, legalism and um, a real, uh, you know, do this or else type thing. I mean, that's what my, my mother grew up with that. She grew up almost afraid of the sacred heart image because she was like, oh, God's watching this and I'm, I'm going you know, to do, you know, which is obviously the opposite of what that was meant to be. Mm-hmm. Um, Indeed. So that's what they grew In up fact, with. In fact, the sacred heart was a response to Jansenism. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. So um, that's what they grew up with. And there was a higher, a, too much political power, too much socialist standing, too much deference. There was a clericalism. There was awful, horrendous abuses. I've never heard it put like that before. And that just really hit the nail on the head for me that the, the Irish people view the Catholic Church today the way the Irish people once viewed the English. Yeah. That, that, that was, that's really profound. Yeah. You're the ones holding us back. We yeah. have to throw you off. You're yeah. the oppressor. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, and because <clears throat> of the, the 60s, which happened all over the world, um, and because Ireland was kind of slower to get into that, I mean, like divorce, legal divorce was still illegal in, 90, in Ireland until 1985. I mean, that's like people voted in in 1983, an amendment to the Constitution to protect the unborn. They voted in two to one. Glory to God. But then they removed it. Yeah. Were you there when Street, that happened? I was, Tell us what yeah, that was yeah. like. And um, just, just kind of recap for people watching who were like, what happened in Ireland? Yeah, yeah. Or? So, um... Because, the, the, yeah, <laughs> there was there, yeah. There was two referendums in quick succession in Ireland. Um, and then in the... Yeah. After the scandals, um, there was a real sense in which the church corporate not just our bishops not just our priests not just lay catholics church had lost its moral authority mm-hmm. and lost its ability to talk on things um and and you you were holding us to this standard but you guys were all doing this like how dare you try and speak to us about morality how dare you speak to us about what we're supposed to do not do that coupled with the reports that went into that so like there was like sort of grand jury type reports into this yeah and a friend of mine says he remembers whenever they were released the next day at Sunday Mass, it was like people weren't there. And he thought, oh, they'll come back in a few weeks. And they didn't. Um, and you had mass attendance from 1980s, 90s of like 78, 80% up until 2015, which is like 33% now, maybe slightly less. So that culmination of scandals and, and, and a move away and a secularization. I mean, like my parents grew up with electricity. So that secularization brought about a set of circumstances that the church wasn't ready for. I still think we're not equipped to deal with it. We had a very pious people, a people of faith, deep faith. But as far as Vincent Toomey says, there was an anti-intellectualism. They weren't a thinking church. They weren't a church able to respond to the questions and to the the challenges of, of society and even speak on moral issues to give arguments. And they weren't used to defending their faith. Do you know what I mean? Like you'd ask somebody a question why you believe. Oh, you either believe or you don't. Don't ask questions. And that, that, that's not going to satisfy somebody who's coming through a modern secular culture where they're YouTube atheists and, you know, these different exposed things and movies and agendas and things are like, well, obviously it's not true. Obviously it's not real, you know? Thank you for watching this clip. You can click here to watch the full episode. And I want to say a big thanks to our sponsors and to our amazing patrons for making all of this possible. Please do us a favor before you go, click that subscribe button and then the bell. And that way YouTube will be forced to let you know every time we put out a new episode.